Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Saddleback webinar this week. My name is Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist for Saddleback Educational. Thank you so much for joining us on this Veterans Day. Um, thank you for your service. For those of you who are joining us who are uh, veterans, we appreciate you, and we definitely appreciate everybody for joining us today. As usual, we are starting just a little bit early. We want everybody to get comfortable and uh, understand how it is you can communicate with us today. So you have a control bar. It is at the bottom of your web browser window and there you will find two icons. You have the chat and the Q&A. Now, both of these are very important in terms of communicating with us today and participating in today's conversation. Most of you will be predominantly using the chat. So anytime you want to share your thoughts or communicate with your fellow attendees, please make sure to use that chat feature. Here's another important note about the chat. You have two options. You can chat either with the panelists or you can chat with all panelists and attendees. We highly recommend that you choose from the little drop down there, all panelists and attendees, especially if you are sharing uh, a resource or something like that. You want everybody to be able to uh, get your message in the chat. So be aware there's that little drop down there. So before you hit send on that chat, make sure it's going to exactly who you want it to go to. The chat area is also where we will be posting links to handouts and resources for our presenter today. So, and also for your um, certificates of attendance, which are very important. No worries if, uh, if you have to hop off early, 24 hours after we conclude, you'll receive an email with uh, all of the resources and a link to the recording of the session. Now, if you have a question, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A area. That will allow us to really isolate those questions and answer them a little bit more efficiently. I know sometimes those questions end up in the chat area and that's okay too, but if you remember to put them in the Q&A area, we're able to get to those a little bit faster. While we're waiting to start right at three o'clock, uh, please, if you are on social media, go ahead and follow us. We have the social media information, the Twitter handles for both Saddleback and our presenter today, Leanne Nicholson. So while you're waiting, go ahead and go to Twitter, let everybody know you're joining us for this great learning opportunity today. And we'll get started right at three o'clock Eastern time. So while we're waiting, let's bring in Leanne. Leanne, how are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this uh, amazing Saddleback opportunity. I love your company. We are so thrilled that you are joining us today. We think I, we think you're going to be another fan favorite. We, we have a fan favorite list and we think you are going to be on it. Well, who am I kidding? Everybody's on it. <laughs> I feel like all of our presenters have been have been great and we're, we are so thrilled that you uh, have joined us. So um, as usual, we always like to find out where everybody is located. Let's start with uh, you, Leanne, where are you located today? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and it is actually a very hot day today. I'm a little humid, so my hair's kind of out to here, but I'm looking out my window and we have, we're getting a little of that hurricane weather. So if you hear like rain hitting my window, just know it's just, you know, that hurricane that's being, you know, pushed into Florida and of course some of the Atlanta area, but that's where I'm from. So I'm looking in the chat box and seeing from Indiana, Michigan, Texas, Wyoming, Ethity, Smiley, hello. Good to see you guys. Virginia, another Wyoming, Sarah. Thank you for joining, Sarah. I've done um, some great work with amazing educators in um, Ethity, Wyoming, and they're here. They're joining us. That's wonderful. That's great. Welcome, Wyoming, and welcome, Texas and North Carolina. Um, Chicago. I you're going to see that I was, um, I'm near St. Louis. That's where I grew up. So I lived near Illinois, Fort Worth. I taught in Grapevine, Colleyville, Texas. And of course, we've got Southern California, sunny Southern California. Perfect weather. Welcome. There, right? <laughs> so if you could in the chat, just so Leanne knows a little bit about who's joining us, if it's okay with you, Leanne. Oh, um, I love it. Um, could you just drop in the chat uh, what you, what it is you teach? Yes grade levels, content area, that would be wonderful. First grade, ESL, yes. Middle school, ESL, beautiful. Gifted coordinator, Cheryl, okay. High school, yes, you'll, I have strategies for all grade levels. 
I did make it a little more specific to grades three through 12 with um, examples, but all tools will work K through 12. Spanish, yes. Instructional facilitator, Sarah. Yes, you are. Wonderful one, that's for sure. Yeah, oh, now it's going super fast. Special education. We've got a principal on the line. Thank you for joining us, Pamela. Yes, Pamela, yay, from Ethody. Okay, resource six through eight, middle school, high school. Oh, perfect. You all are going to be thrilled with today's webinar. Yeah. You're going and to Saddleback has so many amazing resources that I used as a classroom teacher um, to reach all my students who were struggling readers, uh, high interest, and yet to add a level that my kids could truly read and comprehend, which is why I have a relationship with Saddleback because they were a lifesaver for me as a teacher. So thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. We've got adult ESL uh, classes as well here. So something Wonderful. to learn um, for, for adults as well. In British Virgin Islands, I wanna be there. <laughs> Wonderful. That is so great for, thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. I mean, I say this every week. Um, we are, are just so honored that you take time to be with us every week and, and we, will, we will keep going. We will keep going with these webinars as long as, as, long as you need us. Hi Twee from Virginia, haven't seen you in a while. Glad you're back, glad you're able to join us today. Oh, and it's and it's nice, Leanne, because we see the same people um, sometimes, and which is which is so cool well, that we I get to have it. this relationship. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. So we're here to talk about the literacy triangle today. Of course, we're always looking for high impact tools for our students. We want the best for them, and we are obviously here to strengthen up our our practice and our toolkit. And to help us with that is Leanne Nicholson. Now, many of you who are joining us today uh, know Leanne and already work with her, uh, but not everybody knows her. So let me go ahead and give you a brief introduction, and then I will let her take it from here and share her great tools. So Leanne is a former teacher of the year, a Jensen certified brain research trainer for over 20 years. And she's authored over 14 practical books, including her 2019 release, Teaching with the Instructional Cha-Cha's Four Steps to Make Learning Stick and Deeper Learning, Seven Powerful Strategies for In-Depth and Longer Lasting Learning. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today, Leanne, and I'll let you take it from here. Okay. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Super excited to talk to you about the literacy triangle. High impact tools for every single kid out there. And uh, first and foremost, I did want to shout out just kind of where I used to teach. Uh, so I started off in Alton, Illinois, and I taught in Gardner Edgerton, Kansas. I taught in the Grapevine Colleyville School District in Texas, and that is where I was introduced to Dr. Eric Jensen and started learning how to teach with a brain of mine. When I started using the tools for teaching with a brain of mine, engagement went like this, and so did student achievement. Drastic change. Um, so I'm here to say that it, it does work. And teaching with a brain of mine uses the highest impact tools. And I'm going to focus on the highest impact tools with literacy today. Um, I, we kept moving. At this point, I started asking my husband for part of the witness protection plan or something. But then I taught in the Lakota School District in Ohio. Um, then I was in Danbury, Connecticut area. And currently, I'm in Georgia. And we are not moving because I have an in-state tuition kiddo. Um, you'll see that uh, we have twins. Keaton is on the right-hand side. He is a senior at Georgia Tech and his twin sister, Aubrey, she is a senior at Auburn, Alabama. That is just a little bit about me, um, but my passion is preventing gaps and closing gaps. And we will have gaps because of the way that we're having to teach kids virtually. It's not ideal, but it, it's working in many cases, but we'll have definitely some opportunities to get them caught up, especially with literacy. Um, so, um, one of you, one of you typed in the uh, chat box that school's a little stressful right now, and I agree with you. <laughs> Life's a little stressful, and there are so many unknowns still um, coming our way. So let's prime our brain for positivity. This is what I do in my classroom. Um, this is what I encourage you to do every single day as you reach and teach your students. But when placed in a positive state, mood, or emotion, the brain is up to 31% more efficient compared to a negative mood. So let's get started. In the chat box, please write something that you're grateful for or something you're looking forward to. You see, every single day we have a choice to feel stressed or blessed, 
and you can't feel the same way at the same time. But my hope is that we choose to feel blessed more. And there are times I truly have to set my phone alarm to say, be grateful, be grateful, be grateful. And I will shout out something that I'm grateful for. So right now in the chat box, I'm going to play a little song and give you about 20 seconds to fill it up on your marks, get set, and please share one idea. Go. Your teammates, yes. Happy to be alive. <laughs> a profession that makes a huge difference. Way to go. I see sunshine. Ah, uh, wife's recovery. Tim, so glad she's okay. Um, health, a garden. Family, family, family. Absolutely. Safe at home. Your children. Thanksgiving ski trip. I'm coming with you, you bet. Woohoo! All the blessings that you can't see, Marilyn. I love that answer. Okay. I usually watch a few of them, but I do want you guys to know that if you continue to add to the chat box, I'm going to read them afterwards. I've already been told by Liz that I will get to read everything that's in that chat box because I can't do it while I'm also trying to teach you all something in one hour. <laughs> okay, so now that our brain has been primed for positivity, um, now we're gonna share what's in it for us. So everybody put your right hand up in the air. It won't hurt, I promise. And turn the dial to WIIFM. And now that you are tuned into my radio station, I'm going to share with you what's in it for you. Now, by the way, we got to do that in our classrooms. Before we teach our reading lessons, our vocabulary lessons, or any little discussion learning target or writing learning target, we've got to get their attention. We got to get them excited about the goal. And that's a learning target. It's a micro goal towards a standard. So here are the three learning targets that we will explore in this power hour. <laughs> so module number one is we can explore and summarize the big picture and key research findings about why reading, discussing, and writing must be part of daily lessons. And I'm going to give you a template that you could use to plan for it. Um, so that's module number one. Module number two is we're going to evaluate and determine the best tools for your classroom to help your students stay engaged before and during reading. That's my biggest chunk of the workshop today. And then I have to finish the triangle and I'm going to give you uh, a few ideas for discussion and a few ideas for writing. And I even told Liz, hey, if you want me to come back sometime, I'll go a little bit deeper in discussion and a little bit deeper with the writing piece. But I had to pick and choose today um, because this is really a full day workshop. It is actually um, becoming a book and it is due in February to Solution Tree. Uh, but I do want you to know that my good friend Melissa Dixon and I rewrote the instructional cha-chas. It came out in 2019, and we found out in January that it won the Teacher's Choice Award. And I want you to know I'm going to give a free copy out to the best tweet. I'm um, only for the live version. So whoever tweets out something awesome about an hour or two after this webinar, I will go into um, the Twitter box and look to see who had the best connection. In other words, you took something I said or something somebody else said in the chat box and you made a connection. And I will reach out to you and I will mail you this book. And um, the book, and by the way, you have to tweet Saddleback and me. You gotta put both of those uh, Twitter handles in there. And so, yes, I hope that one of you will be a lucky winner and who knows, I may see so many awesome ones, we'll have even more winners. But this whole book is about Chunk It. We teach a small bit chew it, the kids are thinking about it. They're doing something with it. And then we check it to see if they know, and then we might need to change our instruction to watch them grow. It's all about cognitive science coming together with a formative assessment process and different change instruction kind of being that whole foundation. Now you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with the literacy triangle? Everything. I'm about to show you the big picture of this literacy triangle. And the kids are going to learn a chunk of information through reading about the content. And they're going to chew it with a thinking job off to the right hand side, you start to see. They're going to chew it through rich discussions. They're going to chew it through a beautiful piece of writing. But that reading is where they're going to learn some of the content. Yes, they're also going to receive chunks from me because I'm going to teach them the skills. So this literacy triangle is the big picture. And I feel like sometimes we are working way too hard. We're planning all these big projects and I'm not against projects, but we've got to have kids reading more, 
discussing more and writing more. And by the way, they all go together. They shouldn't be separated ever. One, while we're reading, we have a thinking job. I can't wait to share that with you. Kids love these thinking jobs. It makes them so engaged. And then we take the thinking job, the things that they tagged and annotated and they discuss them. And, but we gotta tell them how to discuss them, right? And then we come over here and we write about it. So what I'd like to say is this is the big picture. And yes, I see that somebody says, the criteria for success must be part of the reading part, the discussion part, and the writing part. So I hope that you will see that chunk, chew, check, change happens beautifully in the read and discuss write format. We have to check for understanding while they're reading. We have to check for understanding while they're discussing. We have to check for understanding while they're writing. And we always need to respond by changing what we do next. That's the heart and soul of different instruction. Okay. Here's your second opportunity to add to the chat box. I believe in APKing the brain. APKing the brain is called activating prior knowledge. And I would be a hypocrite if I didn't do that right now. So in the chat box, only respond to one of these. And you can put the number one so that we know you're responding to number one or put the number two because we are we notice that you're responding to number two. Number one, what struggles are you noticing among your students when it comes to reading or writing right now? Number two. What literacy strategies do you know work to improve student reading, discussing, and writing? So you can add a number one or add a number two. On your marks, get set, and go ahead and add to it. Decoding but not comprehending, yep. Brief responses, thank you, Jennifer, yes. We're gonna elaborate on what we really want in that writing. Visualize, wow, beautiful statements, beautiful. Sentence frames, yes. <laughs> Activating prior knowledge, building background knowledge with vocabulary, yes. A lot of people, their kids struggling with writing. Jennifer O'Connor, hello, good to see you. Okay. They think reading is hard. They think writing is hard. They get get something because they struggle to want to even start. Now, by the way, I do have something free at my website for you, and it is 18 ways to motivate kids to want to write. I'll tell you how to get that at the very end, though. So thank you for activating prior knowledge. I connect with every single one of you, and now you guys can also see um, some of the struggles that are occurring in our schools right now. And yeah, if they don't have books in their hands at home, are they going to be reading? I know we can give them virtual websites to go to and, and get articles from News ELA. And there are so many places out there where you can get free articles for students to read and free books, tons. I have them listed on my website if you're interested. But um, are the kids reading them? If, if they're in front of a screen all day, do they want to read from the screen again? Um, so we've got to get books in their hands. And I know schools that are doing that. They're ordering books and giving them out when parent-teacher conferences come in. Wyoming, thank you for doing that. Okay, thank you for APK in your brain. That means you should remember this workshop better because I took the time to activate your neural networks. You should make some stronger connections during the workshop. So let's get started. Module number one, I do go pretty quickly during this because it's the research. You have all these slides, by the way, in the handouts. Um, but we can explore in some ways the big picture and key research findings. You see, if, if I can't convince you that reading, discussing, and writing are just foundational formatives that we have to have in our classrooms every single day across all content areas, except PE, unless they teach health. I want PE, I want kids running like crazy. Um, I know it's a little more challenging right now because of virtual learning, but when they do come back, um, I really want PE to um, not engage in all this unless they teach health. Then they need to engage in this. One of my favorite authors is Mike Schmoker, and he's written many books, but he wrote, um, ask students to read about and discuss their topic before writing. You will have less reluctant learners when you ask them to read about something and then discuss it. The more they know about something, the better off they're going to be when it comes to writing. These two skills, he says, help students create more coherent, logical and precise thoughts and language. While writing, new thoughts are often created and build on new insights gleaned from reading and discussion. Writing takes thinking to the next level. Writing is my favorite formative assessment. 
Um, we know it, it is a huge gap closer in our highest poverty schools. We know that. We've known that for years. But are we writing enough in our schools? And some of you said they don't want to write or they write this much or they text <laughs> what they're supposed to be writing. Anyway, Mike Schmoker wrote a book called Focus. You know what he said? Focus on these three things. Reading, discussing, and writing. We know that reading can change the brain in just nine days, like the physical structure of the brain. More connections, more white matter. Um, and we've got research that shows reading completely changes the brain. We know that special interventions are out there that help kids with their exact needs. And um, we know that like Linda Mood Bell had some called visualization and verbalization. What's most important is we know what the kids need and we do something about it. So for example, um, and I know Saddleback's probably gonna get mad at me for saying this, but they actually have a phonics program for middle school and high school kids that don't make them feel like babies. And I don't know, Liz, can you quickly just share what you have for middle school and high school students who still need some phonics instruction? Because those are interventions that we desperately need. Sorry. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not mad. Don't, don't worry about that. So we do have phonics for, uh, for high school, for middle and high school. If any of you out there need something like that, you have students who, who um, really need to go back to the beginning and really learn the code, uh, but you don't have the resources because so many of those phonics books out there were really created for early readers. And we don't wanna give our, um, our older readers like that, the cat set on the mat type of, of phonics readers. So we have, um, we have a, a, a whole library uh, of phonics readers, and I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, you can check them out at our website. I don't want to take up too much of Leanne's time, but they're on the website. Go ahead and email me if you need more information. Um, I can send you some PDF samples. Whatever you need, just let me know. All right. Awesome. Thanks, yeah, that's just another example of an intervention that so many teachers need and will need. Uh, reading research. Every student every day needs several hours of authentic reading in order to grow into strategic readers. Wow every day several hours how many hours are your kids in your building reading yeah middle school and high school too add it all up this magic triangle has got to happen in every content area at middle school and high school um, at elementary there you know we've got the balanced literacy piece that i'm going to explain in just a second we found that the relationship between time spent reading and reading scores to be directly correlated we already know these things in other words in order to develop proficient children proficiency, children need a high volume of reading practice. What do they read? What does the research say should they read? Well, a variety of text. We also know balanced literacy with phonics. I'm not gonna get on the reading wars right now. Don't get me started. But uh, my friend Katie McKnight and I, we wrote an article that you can go to my website and get for free about the reading wars. Bottom line, your kids need to read complex text they need to read books at their instructional level and at their independent level. All three. There is no this one only. Okay, so I don't even understand why we have reading wars occurring. Um, you need all types of reading. In fact, balanced literacy with phonics instruction. I always emphasize that we've got to have strong phonics instruction in our K through three classrooms. Um, if it's missing, it will hurt the kids from you know fourth grade and up. They need that phonics instruction. So reading aloud, your students should hear you read aloud, but if that's the only thing you're giving your kids, we're in big trouble. And by the way, you should be reading aloud something that they hope to read someday. I always read aloud 21 Balloons to my fifth graders. Um, they just loved 21 Balloons. They were on the edge of their seats and there were so many beautiful creative words in 21 Balloons. Shared reading, this is grade level and it is complex and we read it together. And then there's guided reading. Uh, there's research to support all four types of reading that you see on the screen right now. We need guided reading, but if that's the only thing you do, they're missing out on complex text. And complex text does a whole nother thing to our brains. We need all four types. Um, and independent reading. We've got to make sure our kids are reading at that independent level. 
And um, so that's what I want to share. That's what works. We need a little bit of all of those. And you've got to decide at the middle school and high school level, well, that teacher's always reading aloud. Um, that teacher's doing the shared reading and social studies. Can you do a little bit of all of these in your classroom? Who's making sure that the kids are reading independently every single day with a book that they love and a book that they've chosen? Okay, so that was reading. There's way more research, so go get my article. We gotta get to discussion though. This, we all know discussion works. Discussion is a way for us to chew on content and consolidate it and formulate questions. So some of you are writing questions. Some of you are sharing your thoughts. That's because you're, you're, you wanna discuss it. It is natural for us to wanna discuss things that we've learned. And then Douglas Reeves, I love anything by Douglas Reeves, but he says he's a big expert in assessment and content area reading and writing. He says writing is the skill most directly related to improved scores in reading, social studies, science, and even math. Writing, writing, writing. Daniel Willingham, one of the biggest gurus out there as far as here's what reading does for the brain. He has some great books, by the way, but he basically says students remember what they think about. So make sure they have discussions after they read. Writing is an extension of memory and writing expands memory. Um, actually, a lot of neurologists um, and neuropsychologists will say, if you want kids to remember your content, give them opportunities to discuss it and then write about it. Writing was one of the top memory strategies or tools out there. Writing, writing, writing. What types of writing? Well, according to this book called Make It Stick, if you really want learning to stick, these researchers have come together and share the science of successful learning. And they, see, they said we need some summaries. We need main ideas in their own words. Compare and contrast is huge. Asking them to compare and contrast um, concepts. Synthesize and analyze. And yes, I see somebody's like, okay, do they write on paper or do they write with typing? I'll quickly answer that because um, the re we did do that research, not me personally, but I was curious. And they found that if kids write with paper and pencil, they wrote more, they elaborated, and they had definitely more ideas to write about. Not a whole bunch more than typing. So here's what we're gonna have to do right now. Um, there's an opportunity to ask kids to write on paper and show it or to take a picture of it and send it to you if you're teaching virtually. But um, we want a little bit of both. This is 21st century. Computers are not going away. In fact, we're relying on them even more. Yes, I will be discussing the math piece of this too. So you're going to see some math examples. Um, I believe that reading, discussing, and writing have to happen in the math classroom. I'll give you more examples coming up. So what if? We took our social studies and science curriculums and our math and designed our nonfiction text and articles around them to enhance the learning by organizing, creating a unit around those standards. What if we had thematic teaching occurring where they were reading about our content? And obviously I'm going to need to teach some things as well to them. But if I'm always being the one to give them the content, they're not reading about it. We've got to get them reading about it. Probably the biggest complaint I'll have teachers at the middle school say to me, well, they can't read, so I have to read it to them, or I just have to give them the lecture. That's not going to help. We got to help them read. Our students should read a variety of texts with difficulty every single week, a different level of difficulty. There's a time to just sit back and enjoy that book and, and just have a peaceful time of reading. I know some schools in um, Maryville, New York, um, that's near Buffalo, where the, at that middle school and high school, these kids read independently every single day. And it's just quiet in these ELA classrooms. And you can see a teacher pulling some students and helping and conferring with them and giving them the just right book based on their interest level and something that they will be successful with. It's just a beautiful thing because they know it's so important. We, what if we use the highest impact tools to teach reading rich discussions in writing skills? So I'm going to give you the highest impact tools um, for reading today. A little bit on discussion, a little bit on writing, but I'm going to give you a whole list and their effect sizes. Now, I know what you're probably wondering. What do you mean effect sizes, Leanne? How do you measure if something's impactful? Have you heard of John Hattie? Robert Marzano? These are key researchers in education. I guarantee you know these people. But 
I like to take their research and say, okay, if this dial that you see on the screen right now, if this dial were right outside your door, would you turn the dial to raise your impact every day? Yes, <laughs> that's why we became teachers. And so we wanna use the highest impact tools. So how do we know what those are? Well, we know because of something called an effect size. And basically John Hattie, Robert Rosano collected a whole bunch of research meta-analyses on a certain topic. They plug it into an equation called effect size, actually a couple of different equations and out pops a number called effect size. I actually had to do this in my classroom on a tool called reciprocal teaching. And it was really high, very high impact in my classroom. Um, and John Hattie agrees that reciprocal teaching has a high impact. So if this number is high, it can produce very high achievement if we use the tool accurately. If the number is low, probably won't hurt the kids unless it's in the red zone. Okay, those things hurt the kids. But if it's just a lower number, um, it's not gonna hurt them, but it may cause frustration on their end and on your end because you're gonna have to do more reteaching. So basically it tells me if I should use this tool or not. We don't have time to waste. We have to use the highest impact tools. So what's a high impact? Well. Um, John Hattie says he created this barometer of influence and he says it's anything 0.4 or more. If anything has an effect size of 0.4 or more, then it can work. It can work beautifully. Now, not all 0.4s or mores are created equally. So if you have anything with effect sizes of 0.4 to 0.6, you have about one year of growth. But anything beyond 0.6, you can go beyond one year of growth. So if you have kids behind, you gotta use 0.6s or more. I promise you, you have to use 0.6s or more. Now I need, to, I need you guys to memorize something. So say this in your head three times. 1.00 is two years of growth. Go ahead and say it three times. 1.00 is about two years of growth. 1.00 is about, what does this mean? It means if a kid is a whole year behind, we can get that kid caught up in one school year by using some of these tools that are 1.00 or more. So who wants to find out which tools might have that type of effect size? Please turn to page six in my packet. Now, by the way, you have my slides. I won't refer to those page numbers, but I have a beautiful packet you will want to get. And I know Liz has told you a couple of times, they'll probably share it again, how to get this packet. But in this packet, you will see page six. And page six, just look at all these worked examples in math with um, explanations and asking the kids to write explanations about it. Response to intervention, classroom discussions like a debate, 0.82. Jigsaw method where different kids are reading different articles, then they come together and discuss it and teach it, and then it ends in a piece of writing. Beautiful, 1.2. Metacognitive strategies, that's, that's so much of what I'm gonna share with you today. Predicting, having the kids predict. Similarities and differences, 1.32, summarizing, 0.79. Now, by the way, these are just averages. I know they're effect sizes. We can make them better though by differentiating every single one of these based on what we know about our kids. But look at writing, everybody. It's the last one, 1.47. Now you can Google John Hattie and you can see all the effect sizes. I just put a few on the, on the slide here because these are the ones I wanted you to see they can happen in all kinds of classrooms. So that's the big picture. I just gave you the research and I'm about to go into more depth with the reading section. Look at the reading, you'll see before reading and during reading. And then after reading, we don't do worksheets. No, we don't have time for worksheets. We're gonna have rich discussions and we're gonna put some scaffolding in place so our kids are successful with these discussions. And then we're gonna have them write about it. Now, by the way, if your, your kids will have better discussions and better writing opportunities, if we get this thinking job right, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on this thinking job for reading. Now you're probably wondering, Leanne, this looks great, but uh, how do you plan for that? I've got a template for you, it's on page five. Um, the template has been used across the nation in all kinds of schools. I coach um, teachers after the one day workshop, I help them design a literacy triangle lesson plan template and I give them feedback. I show them how to do criteria for success for the reading and the discussion and the writing. It's a beautiful tool. You don't necessarily need me. You can look at this tool and you can create a lesson plan. Yes, it could take one, two or three days because the reading might be a full day, 
But by the way, don't just have them read the full 50 minutes if you're a middle school. There should be reading and discussion going on. And before they leave, there should be a little writing opportunity possibly. On day two, there's reading, but maybe a debate. So we go deeper into discussions and then still a little writing opportunity before they leave. And then on day three, we go deeply and we use what we tabbed in our reading um, we use our discussion notes and then we start to write and we might have the whole class period writing a response to what we've read and we give them choices. Yeah, choice and voice are high motivators and we're going to need them right now. Kids aren't as motivated. There's a lot of stress. And so those are some ideas. Okay, so that's the big lesson plan template. Here is a processing point. So I just gave you a big chunk on research and the big picture and the template. Here's your chew. I'm gonna check for understanding. And I might change my instruction based on what I see in the chat box. So at this moment in time, let's take about 40 seconds. Examine that literacy triangle lesson plan. Don't worry, I'll go back to the slide in case you haven't printed it. And in the chat box, write what you like about it. Write what changes you would make with it and why. It's not perfect. And I guarantee you're gonna to need to make changes based on what your district has given you as well. And what questions do you have about it? So you just take one of those, share what you like. What changes would you make? What questions do you have? I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the slide list so you can see it and light up the chat box on your marks, get set and go. <laughs> Beautiful, Pedro. Yes, you would add definitely several examples in there. Yes, it's a clear picture of how they all come together. It's literacy, isn't it? But yes, you do have the full size page in your packet. I'm so sorry, this is a smaller version. Replace discussions with or for virtual. Um, with discussions, I would do my very best to have a Zoom meet for a quick discussion if they would show up for it. And there are ways to get kids to show up on Zoom. Um, I, I can't speak for all students, but um, that's what I would do is have a discussion through a Zoom. Vocabulary is so important. Yes, Patricia, that's a whole day workshop right there. But I'm going to give you a few tools today. Our EL kids, I'm going to give you the top 10 ways to pre-teach for your EL students. You're going to get that too. And sentence frames for speaking and writing. You are right on who just said that. How can you increase discussion if students are not attending live class discussions? I agree. That's a challenge right now, Afonso. And I'm going to open that question up to a whole bunch of people who are watching. We've got 149 teachers watching right now. Um, having, how do you increase discussions if they're not attending live class? Uh, the discussion piece might be where they um, post things on social media as well and the kids respond appropriately. These kids know Facebook. <laughs> they know all kinds of different social media where they can respond to each other. I think Flipgrid might be another one. Yes, Smiley, thank you for choice. Structure of the template um, really helps us think through each and every step. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna keep reading those later, but for time's sake, I gotta move on. Module number two, we're going into the reading tools now. And um, so here's where I'm very excited to share with you. Um, we're going to talk about before reading and during reading. And before reading, we want to make sure that we pre-teach some vocabulary. We might need to prime your brain with a few details, and we should always activate prior knowledge. And then I'm going to share with you what to do with that during reading piece. We have a lot of research that says reading. We should be thinking about it with, um, I'm going to say, metacognition before reading, metacognition during reading, and metacognition after reading. Um, we've got to get our kids thinking about their thinking while reading, after reading, during the reading, all three moments. Now, if you open up your packet, pages seven and eight, here's a transparency moment from Leanne. I designed pages seven and eight years ago 
when I was trying to understand reading in the content area, we were required to teach reading in social studies and science. And we wanted to make it engaging and exciting. So we created little activities before, during and after. And I just collected things. I collected graphic organizers. I collected ways to activate prior knowledge. I collected short, sweet writing opportunities afterwards. And I've learned so much more since then, but research is still saying there should be some thinking beginning during and after. Now, I bet you guys have seen this tool. It's pretty old, but man, is it still powerful. The International Reading Association says that anticipation guides, they, they just work. Kids like them. You can use this virtually. You can go to this website, and I think they have four or five different choices of, um, of templates that you can type into and save. Some of you use Canvas, you can plug all, any and all templates into Canvas. So you can take this and do that. Now, what you have to do is you have to design some statements that are true and some that are false and some that are a little controversial. So I just wrote one in there. Dopamine can last a long time in the prefrontal cortex. Now pretend there are six statements. I can't do that for time's sake, but pretend there are six. Some are true, some are false, but the kids don't know. And they're about to read an article about dopamine and how it motivates the brain to want to learn and to explore and to figure out if they're right or wrong, which is why anticipation guides work so well, because it sparks some dopamine in this frontal lobe right here. And they naturally want to know if they're correct or incorrect. So they go through these six statements before reading and they check agree or disagree. They don't know the answers yet. And then I ask them to turn it over. I don't want them changing their answers during the reading because guess what happens during the reading? You start to hear the grunts of yes or oh man, like they remember what they wrote. They remember if they put agree or disagree. After the reading, they come back and they flip it over and um, they flip it over and then they say disagree. And they realized that they were incorrect. Hey, on page 12 in the article, dopamine really is a short-term burst. Okay, so I'm sharing this with you because it's a before, during, and after reading all in one called an anticipation guide. Yeah, it's been around for years. But you know what's interesting is I don't see a lot of teachers using it. And kids love it. It keeps them into the text. Then we have a discussion about dopamine. And then they choose one of the six statements to do a short, quick write. This one doesn't necessarily promote a longer writing piece, but it brings the reading, discussing, and writing all together. Okay, so we're going to do the big three before reading. Pages seven and eight, that's Leanne's cheat sheet. I designed that cheat sheet years ago. Yes, I've added to it. I've tweaked it. But um, before reading is the only section I'm really going to get into, but you can get to the during reading and after reading section on your own. Um, but preview the text and tricky words. Pre-teaching a few vocabulary words is critical. Wait till I show you the research. Then we're going to activate prior knowledge. Then we have to create a purpose and a plan. So those are the big three things you want to do before reading. So direct vocabulary instruction. Go ahead, look at the slide. Is it worth your time? Yes, it's absolutely worth your time. The effect size of pre-teaching vocabulary is 0.97. But look at the jump in comprehension when they just paused and explicitly taught what these words meant. Now, what does the research say? How do we teach these words? Well, there's a lot, there are a lot of different ways to teach vocabulary words. I love Marzano's way of teaching. I call it the big six. There are so many other options out there, but bottom line. When we teach words, pages 10 and 11, you'll see all of these explained, by the way, teachers should provide a description, something all kids in the classroom can understand. We don't read a definition. We give a description that's kid-friendly. Then we restate the explanation, and the kids restate the explanation. Non-linguistic representation is always, always an image when we define words, always some type of image. We help the kids make connections, elaborate, and play games. It makes it way more fun. Now, by the way, pages 12 and 13 in my packet, 10 ways to pre-teach vocabulary words where your EL students won't forget them. A whole list of them. Please go and grab them. Then we got to activate prior knowledge. Reading comprehension is tied closely to what the reader brings to the page, to what the reader knows before reading. 
you can do this so quickly. I, I, these four colored spinners were so cheap. Well, now every kid will have to have their own because of COVID. Um, but um, it's worth it. I even made some, but you can buy them really inexpensively. But we put kids in groups of three or four, yes, with their masks on, or some of you have the plexiglass already in place in your classrooms. If they're in person, I've seen this too. And if I'm in a group of about three um, other kids, if I spin red, I get to answer the red question. And these four questions are about my text. My teacher designed them. <laughs> my teacher created four questions that would help me connect my life to the text because my teacher knows that connections equals relevance equals memory. So just by having a spinner and you designing four questions and the kids just get excited because it's a spinner. What are they going to get? Remember, whenever we get kids to predict, dopamine can flood that frontal lobe. That's why the anticipation guide works so beautifully. Okay, then number three. This is where I'm going to spend a little bit more time on creating a purpose and a plan. Reading is thinking, and it's our job as teachers to make sure kids are thinking while they're reading. We need evidence that they're getting it to got it. My learning target's very important. And while they're reading, I want to see if I can gather some evidence. So we call that a thinking. Now, I don't know if you can see me too well, but um, I've got schools that created these little cards where they put their mascot and they have thinking job and they laminate them. And then they use these tabs. Now these tabs, I promise you, I'll show you a bigger slide of these in a second. At the dollar store, you get 500 of these tabs and they stick over 20 times on a laminated surface. And I tried them out one night. So anyway, I know I'm so bored these days. No, I'm not, <laughs> but I love these. So while they're reading, they're gonna tab some things. By the way, this frees their brain up to say, I think this is, one of the causes, I'm just going to tab it right now. They can move that tab and it's fast. It's simple. It's sweet. Uh, my EL students, my EL students loved these. Um, and yes, middle school and high school students can use them too. I'm going to give you some other choices as well. While they're reading, even the math word problem, they can use tabs or they can annotate the word problem. But while they're reading, they need to basically document somehow, some way they're thinking. We've got to walk around and ch ch check for understanding to make sure that they're reading with a purpose in mind. On the screen right now, you'll see lots of purposes. And there are so many purposes for reading. By the way, I don't buy a book unless I have a purpose. So for example, I recently bought this book called Hope Rising. And why did I buy it? Because I do workshops on optimism and gratitude and how we can change our brain. And I see a lot of people losing hope this past year. I've seen some people give up just short term, but they get back on track. Um, so I'm very fascinated by the science behind hope. So I have a purpose. And my purpose is I'm going to write articles about it. I wrote my first one. It's already on my, art, um, on my website. Go find it. But I had a purpose for buying that book and reading it. And I tabbed it. I annotated it. Because it's my book, I can write all over in it. Okay. So turn to pages 16 and 17. This is a goldmine gift for you. Please use pages 16 and 17. I took some of the most common um, standards out there, whether you use Common Core or not, um, but I took some of the most common standards and I gave you some questions that could become thinking jobs. Because a question, um, a thinking job should be a question. I gave you some for informational text and some for literary text. That's my favorite gift to you today. But I want to share with you what it really looks like. So this is a fourth grade one. I kind of chose middle of the road. And um, let's look at the very first one. RL 4.3 is the standard number. And it is describe in depth a character, a setting, or an event in a story or drama, drawing on specific details in the text. So this is my mini lesson. I have an I can statement, my learning target. I can describe a character based on specific details in the text. So I take a little piece of that standard. And we're going to focus on the character, describing a character. So kids, your thinking job today. So here's our I can statement. Your thinking job while reading is, what do you learn about Bluish, the character, throughout this journal entry? And every time you learn something about it, you're going to put a tab. And you're just going to tab details. I'm going to ask you to tab four details. You could say three, you could say two, and you're going to need to model it. You're going to have to get them started. 
at the high school level. Um, big long standard. Here's an I can statement. Um, I'm going to do the green one. I can determine which quotes support two ongoing themes and explain how the themes interact with one another. That's the I can statement. That's the learning target. I post that day. That's the goal. Here's your thinking job, kids. Which quotes are examples of how the theme, how the themes recur or developed in the text? Tag with sticky arrows. Again, just tag them. How do they interact with one another will be a great discussion question. Be prepared um, to have the discussion on your team of students. How do they interact with each other? Now, I did some work in Vero Beach, Florida, and this is Sean Conway. I have no idea if Sean's on here or not. Um, Sean's just, uh, just a fun teacher. He took this a whole nother level. I was watching him do a guided reading lesson and he wanted some feedback on it. And he just embraced this learning and this thinking job by asking the kids to get in a thinking job position. It just looks like this. Now, obviously we don't, this is pre-COVID. <laughs> so they really should have their fingers by their mouth, but I love how he got them excited about it. Okay, so how to make reading visible. Number one, just have a thinking job and measure it with the tabs. Okay, sticky notes maybe. You know, if you wanna go deeper, don't use the tabs, use sticky notes. If you wanna go even deeper, high school teachers and middle school, and by the way, I've done annotations with second grade and first grade annotations in the text. Let me quickly give you some examples of these. Here are those tabs. And the reason you have tabs is so you don't write in the book. This child wrote in the book anyway. You might do sticky notes. Now, never, never, ever, please do not photocopy page 18 and give it to your kids. It's overwhelming. We give them a couple of, I'm going to say, symbols. So if you're working with vocabulary, you might show them some vocabulary symbols and let them choose two that while they're reading, they're going to tab their book with some of these symbols on sticky notes. Um, I know a school, Odenton um, in Maryland, Annapolis area, where this K through five school said, these are the symbols we're gonna use in our school. We can't have different symbols all the time. Um, we are going to have to ensure that um, we uh, use the same symbols. Our kids don't need a million symbols thrown at them. So they had common symbols for their close reading. I was so excited about that. And I want you to know they had sticky notes. They were circling words they didn't know. This kid had a little creative moment and he looked up the words and wrote the definition in there. And another one that he chose was asking questions. And he did ask the author a question. And the question is, will the markings play a role in the story later? And the answer is yes, great question. Now, how do we look at these? Well, you're probably thinking, how do you walk around to every single kid and check these? Now with these, it's easy in a small group. It's really easy to see what they're tabbing. And as I walk around, I can see what they're tabbing and ask them questions. So reading has become visible now. Reading becomes visible with sticky notes. And then I can collect the sticky notes by having them place them on a piece of paper. But what I really want is them to use the sticky notes for discussion. Can I just tell you a quick story? In third grade, my son had an amazing teacher in Connecticut and her name was Miss, Mrs. Creighton. And she asked all the kids to go home and share their sticky notes of their metacognition of what they were thinking about while they were reading. Guess what? My son, my little third grade boy, had to sit next to me and share his sticky notes. I loved every second of it. Um, I don't think he would do that in college right now. No, I know he wouldn't. Okay, but anyway, I loved it. So I dare you to even have your kids share it with somebody at their home. Maybe it's an older sibling even. Maybe it's a younger sibling. Hey, sit next to me. Let me share with you my metacognition about what I was reading. Um, obviously, annotations go with close reading. I've given you a whole list of annotations. Again, pick and choose, differentiate. Which annotations do those three kids need? Which annotations do those 10 kids need? Please don't give everybody the same symbols. That's what differentiation is all about, is to help all kids be successful. And by the way, here's some pictures of what annotations can look like. Okay, so let's wrap this section up because then I have two small sections left. In summary, before students read, we should always, this is where it's really hard to not have all the participants shout back at me. If you wanna type anything in the chat box, go for it. 
But um, before students read, we should always pre-teach. I'll give you that answer. Thank you, Smiley. Way to go. You are supporting me. We should always pre-teach critical words that will assist. Starts with a C. Comprehension. Man, Smiley, you are, you ding, 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 ding. That's awesome. We can activate their prior knowledge. Jessica, way to go. Okay. Then we help them set a purpose or a, starts with a T. Target, I like. Yep. TJ, thinking job. Yes, but learning targets great too. So whoever wrote that, I like it. This purpose will help them annotate or tag the text to find the answers to the task. This will assist in discussions and in writing. Congratulations. Okay. Hey, before we move on to the last module, which is short and sweet, you get to add one idea to the chat box. You can answer number one or number two. Please just put in the chat box a one and then answer it. And then if you choose number two, put a two in the chat box and answer it. I'm going to play a fun song while you choose which one of these you want to answer. On your marks, get set and go. Anticipation guides, yay. Setting a purpose for reading. Using that activating prior knowledge, yes. Pre-teaching. Thinking jobs, yes. Text tagging, setting a purpose. Modeling, modeling, modeling. Over and over and over. I love it. That's always my hope, is that everybody gets something out of every single chunk of information. Okay, again, I will come back to those. I will read everybody's responses. Let's go to module number three. We can demonstrate and practice how to engage our students in deeper discussions about what was read and determine how to respond with um, power writing. Again, these, these are at least two hours long. I spend at least two or three hours on discussions. I could spend a whole day on that one, but writing is a full day workshop for me. Sometimes two full days because we design things in the training. So I'm giving you this much because I wanted to spend the majority of my time on reading today. Um, so we're going back to the triangle. We did the reading piece. We're going to go to discussing. Now let me share something really big here. Sometimes we create 10 discussion questions and we have the kids write the answers down on paper and they have to bring them to the discussions. I see most kids put their heads down and they tune out after the second one. Let's choose two beautiful discussion questions and that's it. And let's choose the thinking job. Now that they, they've already tabbed your thinking job. Now they get to talk about the thinking job. How fun is that? Well, I tagged this one because. Well, I annotated this because. Um, here's my sticky note that I uh, noted as a question for the author. So the first thing they should do is definitely um, just share what they tagged for the thinking job. The second thing might be a little more of a debate where there is no right or wrong answer and we go to deeper learning. But um, promoting meaningful talk is extremely important. Um, it is crucial to language development and students' ability to think, speak, understand, read, write, and communicate. In fact, the kids who have experienced reading, discussing, and writing, they have all said that writing was easier because they had the reading and discussion tied together. By the way, the writing should be tied to the thinking job somehow too. Whatever they tag, they should be able to go back to that text and use in their writing as well. You can go deeper with it too with your prompts. You can differentiate your prompts. That's even better yet. One way students learn words is by hearing them used in diverse um, contexts, by asking questions about them and by discussing them with peers and teachers. So how do we set up deeper conversations? Well, teachers, you get to create a prompt that gets the kids excited to wanna to discuss that they read about. Um, I do believe the thinking job is a great first discussion tool. Students first think on their own, maybe write their thoughts on a sticky note, maybe a dry erase board, give them time to think about that response. And then they share in a small group and I get to create these small groups. I heterogeneously group them so that we have such a variety of kids in a group. You don't want five talkers together. <laughs> you want a variety of kids in these groups and you want to make sure that you're changing these groups. They're flexible. 
now open the discussion up for the whole group so each small groups discussing then we bring it up to the whole classroom that has an effect size of 0 0.80 when we bring it up as a whole classroom discussion too so prop one could be notice Lee's not saying it has to be never would i do that prop one could be about the thinking job or what they annotated Prompt two could take them on a deeper dive into the text they just read. And I do believe we should give them choices. I believe we need criteria for success or we're going to get DS. Yeah, you know what DS stands for. Diddly squat. We don't have time for diddly squat. <laughs> we never had time for it and we certainly aren't going to have time for it this year or next year. So if you want the discussions to go a certain way, you have to teach them. You have to model it. You have to expect it and you have to remind them. They get so excited in discussions. So I like to create a chart paper that says our discussion is focusing on the prompt, is giving everyone opportunities to participate. I might even have to give them talking chips and must use some of those vocabulary words that I pre-taught. You know, I love that we pre-teach vocabulary, but we forget to flood it through the discussion. Inspect what you expect. We've got to expect, I taught it to them. I want them to start using it. I start to help them use these words. And these words are on the wall. These words are on cards. Maybe they're logged. That's a whole nother workshop on vocabulary. But being prompted by sentence starters as well. We will need some sentence starters. And they get to use the vocabulary words I pre-taught. So pretend these are the words I pre-taught. And I put them up on a word splash. I make sure they're at the kid's fingertips. Okay, so that was as much as I can do on discussion because I want to end it with writing. We want to make writing emotional. Um, if you look at the screen right now, how are you writing today? I wish I could have you raise your hands, but um, you know, raise your hand if you've written something frantically recently, reflectively. I, I've, been, I've been writing a lot with, um, in, in my journal, passionately. I'm going to skip romantically. <laughs> hope that's okay with everybody. Intellectually, humorously, but writing should have an emotion tied to it. Why? Because then we want to write about it. Now, that's a whole nother thing when it comes to trauma, though. That's another workshop about trauma and writing. And um, I wrote an article about that. It's on my website, so you can go find it. But I'm not talking about writing about trauma right now. I'm talking about writing about what we've learned. How do we make it emotional to where they want to write about it? Well, opinion writing, is it just leads right into emotions and passions, right? Um, and ProCon.org allows my EL students to see the pros and cons of all kinds of issues at a readability level and a comprehension level that they can decide if they agree or disagree and why. Love that. Um, ProCon.org, I'm pretty sure it is. But um, we've got to get our kids writing more. It is the key to building this executive function right here. And by the way, when we're stressed, executive function is weaker. And yes, you guys have already been typing it in the chat box. We want to make sure that we're giving them sentence starters. Um, they need them and give them a variety to choose from. We might even have to create some writing frames. So that's called scaffolding. But we start to remove those lines. So some kids need that scaffolding, but then we start to remove them, not all at once, <laughs> gradually. And it's going to be different for every single kid. We're going to need to provide graphic organizers to help them organize their writing. But writing prompt could be connected to the thinking job or extended to deeper thinking. This writing prompt should push them back to the text. I know I have about three more minutes, so here I go. Here are some ways to make writing, I'm going to say, more powerful. Ask the kids to help you create the criteria for success for the informational writing essay. This is an um, um, informational writing essay for a middle schooler. and um, and by the way, writing in math, what do you want in that writing for math opportunity and that exit ticket? Um, do you want the math terms? Do you want complete sentences? We can still read a word problem, mark it all up. OK, and then we discuss that word problem and then we write about that word problem. We write about our thinking or the strategies. So you have so many choices in math for how they can write. Yeah, it's going to be a shorter, sweeter response than you might see in social studies and science. Um, this is an example of third grade opinion writing. Notice the criteria for success on the left hand column. If you don't tell them what you want, you're going to get DS, <laughs> diddly squat. Even kindergartners, look at the right-hand side. This is from Detroit, Michigan. And this was called five-star writing and the kids would check it off. By the end of the kindergarten school year, 
they need to make sure their opinion writing has those pieces according to their standards. Hey, what about a summary? What do you want in the summary? You've got to tell them what you want in that summary. And um, this was a group of fourth grade teachers at Vero Beach Elementary. Um, they, they were getting tired of getting diddly squat for their summaries. They got two sentences. And I said, well, have you told your kids what you want in the summary? And, and then show them an exemplar. And then you have to pull small groups and support them. Yeah, you're gonna have to have some fill in the blanks for some of your EL kiddos. They knocked the socks off their summaries in just a matter of a month and a half because of this example right here. Now my math people, here you go. Um, this was happening in Riverton Middle School um, in Wyoming. And they've got this magic triangle going on in all their classrooms um, at this middle school. And the math teachers incorporated in their daily exit tickets. I know a few teachers and Du Bois um, as well, Du Bois, Wyoming, where they're doing this maybe twice a week, not necessarily every single day, but they're incorporating writing and student self-assessment. And there's an example for you. And then we give feedback. That's a whole nother workshop. Feedback with writing. This one's just a real fun one called Tag Feedback, and it's among students. It's peer feedback. Okay, I have to end because they told me to. <laughs> I could talk for another hour. Uh, for those of you that know me, you know I could talk for another hour, but I really want to encourage you to go to my website. There's so many free resources. I just put up the 18 ways to motivate reluctant writers because um, I just thought you would want that. So go to my website and go ahead and get that. While I pass this on to Liz, I would love for you to write down the most valuable piece of information from the whole entire one hour webinar. What was the most valuable piece of information from the whole thing? And Liz, thank you for inviting me. I had so much fun and I cannot wait to read the whole chat box. This was amazing. Um, we have a few questions that we can we can tackle um, in the few minutes that we have left. Uh, people are going ahead and putting down their most valuable piece of information. They're loving the resources, loving the resources. So while you all are, are doing that, let me go ahead and share with you what is coming up next week because we are going to continue the conversation around literacy next week with Tina Bean. So the topic next week is going to be uh, literacy through social studies. You know, sometimes our content area teachers uh, don't, don't realize or don't feel like they have the tools to use that content to really boost literacy. Uh, Tina is going to come and share some great resources and practices with us next week. So please join us. Uh, you can register on our website or as usual, you will be receiving an email prompting you to register and we hope to see you next week. So let's jump into some of the questions we had. Um, there were a lot that came through that you sort of already answered, mm -hmm. but let's just get to the most important, the most important questions. Do you have any more sessions coming up that people can attend? <laughs> well, we don't have them on the calendar um, and I don't have this webinar format. Um, so I do them based on whichever company invites me in. And um, I'm grateful that Saddleback invited me in. So. Um, I'm happy to do another session on discussion or another session on writing um, when Saddleback has opportunities. So um, I would love that. Thank you. That was that's very nice. Very well, people nice. are people want more for sure. And there, uh, there another related question is: um, Can this be two sessions? Um, I, I need more time. This is a lot of information. And I think the answer to that is actually: How many sessions is this, <laughs> Leanne? Because I know this, you. This is well. This is my whole day workshop. And okay. um, I actually have two days of strategies because sometimes schools say we want more on reading. So Lee, we want the first full day on reading and then we want the next session, a blending of discussion and writing. Other schools will say we want a little bit on reading and vocabulary and discussion, but we want a full day on writing. It just depends on what you need. And of course I do customize everything. So half day, um, I, it's, it's, it's really hard to do it in one hour. But um, I wanted to introduce the big picture, and I love that teachers, they got the big picture, and a lot of teachers are feeling encouraged, I'm seeing in the chat box, that makes me so happy um, that they're feeling encouraged instead of discouraged. But um, it is a book I'm writing, and it is supposed to, I'm turning it into Solution Tree in February, I hope, <laughs> and then um, it'll be all in one compacted book, but obviously the differentiation components will depend on the students in your classroom and their needs. Awesome. I think uh, we would 
uh, just for our audience, we will definitely be inviting Leanne back to do a follow-up to this, potentially more focus uh, on the writing. So no worries there. Uh, however, um, it, it will be um, probably after after her book is due because we want her to be able to get that book done so we can get that out and make it available to you. Aww. But for sure, we will have her back. Um, please keep an eye out because um, Leanne, you are welcome back at any time. Um, I will just remind everybody, I'm going to go look at the tweets in about an hour or two, and um, I will contact you if you're a winner, and I will mail the book. It should take a couple of days, but you'll have that book. The Introductional Cha-Cha book has a lot of literacy tools in it. I just want everybody to know that. So, That's a great book. Definitely check that one out, everybody. And the, the last question I wanted to um, ask, and this came up way early on when you showed that slide around the uh, the guided reading and the complex task, text, it looked sort of like a flow chart. And somebody chimed in, well, if I have secondary students that have no phonics, um, we talked about how Saddleback has resources for that. But in terms of, of the flow of instruction, I think the question was, what, is, what does that look like? Um, so how do you balance the the phonics instruction, like the absolute basics of the code of the language with the complex text that a high schooler needs. Yeah, well, the good news is we have a lot of free, um, I'm going to say resources on the internet where they have the same article at different Lexile levels like New ZLA, um, readworks.org. They have several free articles as well, but it's really, I'm going to say, taking this concept that they need to learn about in your social studies class or your science class. I don't know who was asking the question, but it's finding different lexile levels because complex what's complex text to you, Liz, might be different complex text level for me. And so as a teacher, I want to differentiate those different components based on my kids' needs. Um, I'm also possibly going to pull a small group here and there, not the same group every single day. We know that doesn't work. It's pulling a small group though and helping them have access to the text by me possibly pre-teaching more, priming their brain more. That's critical with our EL students before reading. Um, but differentiation is the key here and you might need to differentiate the Lexile level that they're receiving. Saddleback, you know all about that. That's actually how I came into contact with you at the SDE um, conference, Staff Development for Educators, I ran into your booth and I just thought it was Christmas because as a teacher, I was like, wow, there's scarlet letter written at all these different levels <laughs> and kids could actually access it and read it and comprehend it and engage in the discussion and engage in their um, writing piece as well. But eventually we can't just keep giving them these levels. We teach them the skills to get here and to here and to here. Um, at your particular school, I would love to say there should be a response to intervention program for middle school and high school students who are struggling to read. And we call that RTI. And um, I would say that Saddleback has some of the best resources to include in that RTI time for your kids to grow in phonics. I know, so here's a science teacher saying, you're telling me as a high school science teacher, I have to teach phonics? We're teaching kids any skill that they need to be successful in our classroom. You might have to teach a small little lesson about long I and what GHT sounds like. I mean like that, but you just taught that kid a skill so that he can comprehend, um, uh, I'm going to say a section from one of your texts um, or articles that you're giving them. So I would say there are a lot of ways to differentiate and one way is to give them different level, Lexile level articles about the same topic that they can access in, I'm going to say in somewhat successful way with your help and your guidance. Thank you so much for answering that question. And thank you to Noemi for putting rewordify.com. She put that, oh, I don't know. Oh yes, she did put it for everybody. Rewordify.com is a nice, uh, a nice free tool for simplifying complex text, especially if you have an English learner or um, perhaps a student with dyslexia or something like that. So for sure, check that one out. Yes. Thank you so much to you, Leanne, and thank you to all of our attendees as usual. Uh, Saddleback, it, we're everywhere. Find us on YouTube, find us uh, on Twitter, find us on Instagram, we are there. We love it for you to, uh, to find us there. Follow us, communicate with us. Uh, we're always happy to hear from you. And of course, big thank you. Um, Leanne did a great job today of um, making sure that we focus 
on the positive and you all are doing a great job out there. What you're doing is not easy and we appreciate you, we honor you and we're so thankful that you come and, and learn with us every week. Thank you so much, Leanne and we will see everybody next week with Tina Bean. Thank you and I look forward to reading the chat box. Thanks so much. Bye.